Another thing you need to be aware of is that uh, self-injurious behaviors have a lot of comorbidities because a lot of things can make you want to cut in yourselves and also some things can produce both needing to cut on yourself and other problems. So we could guess that any problems that are associated with early child abuse and neglect, acts of omission or commission, sexual abuse, disattunement, uh, neglect, uh, psychological unavailable caretaking, attachment dysregulation, emotional dysregulation problems, those things produce a lot of problems. And what we want you to do is be able to see if you can detect some of them. So in the manual, you'll especially see uh, that we talk about working with self-injury when it's in the context of these kinds of things. So depression, anxiety, and post-traumatic stress are the big three frijoles we see for self-injurious behaviors, but also suicidality. So Randy in the back and I and some others have actually published a paper showing um, that some people attempt suicide more for depression, some for more for post-traumatic stress, and some more for being triggered in a negative state. So uh, it just reminds us that that uh, the comorbidities, the other things you're struggling with may be feeding self-injurious behavior. So there are some people who literally don't necessarily have bad trauma early in life. It's not that big of a group, but they had such bad trauma, for instance, I've seen it in torture, that they've developed a version of PTSD that then motivates self-injurious behaviors. Uh, so other DRBs are also going to be comorbid. People who cut on themselves tend to do other things too, right? Have you noticed this list doesn't sound like some of your clients have done more than one thing. They may cut, but they may also have compulsive sexual behaviors. They may binge purge. They may be impulsively aggressive or they may steal things or they may do risky things, etc. Suicidality is an obvious comorbidity. They're, they're related. So self-injurious behavior is not suicidal but self-injurious behavior is predictive of being suicidal in your life because they're both ways to do de distress reduction behaviors. The old days, we thought that self-injuring was an early form of suicide. It was called parasuicidality. We now know it's not. In fact, um, for many people, cutting themselves is an attempt not to have to engage in something more severe like suicide. But please don't say to yourself, as several consultees have said to me, I know she's not suicidal because she cuts on herself. Because sometimes what looks like cutting on yourself is really a dry run for suicide. Also, sometimes if, if self-injurious doesn't work, they go to suicidal behavior. And just generally, the best research was actually done uh, at UCLA. Uh, the best research showing if you had to look at just your single best predictor for suicidal behavior other than previous suicidality, it's self-injurious behavior. So I want you to be smart about that. I, don't want, I want you to say that they're engaging in anti-suicidal behavior, but also keep in mind it may not work. It's closely related, uh, and it's actually a predictor in the long run. And the way that I see it, where you really see it linked, is they may have tried self-injury a couple times and it didn't work, so they went to the big, to the big game and went to suicidality. Dissociation, as I mentioned, is very common in DRBs, especially in self-injurious behavior and apparently, according to the literature, bulimia or binging and purging. So dissociation would be something you'd want to check out when you checked out what else is going on. Just to give you an anecdotal, when we were doing that, uh, when Aaron Eady and I were doing that, that uh, fancy uh, statistical analysis, we didn't add dissociation at first. So we had what's called a structural equation model. It looks like a big path analysis with all these variables. And these arrows were going different ways. And then we just dropped in dissociation and all the arrows went different directions. Clearly, dissociation was important. And when it wasn't included, it was a little bit misleading. We discovered that, that actually in that study, if you didn't dissociate, you were relatively unlikely to engage in, in uh, sexual in uh, self-injurious behaviors even though you might but the dissociation was a big deal and then substance abuse screws up everything in all areas whether you're doing an intake in an outpatient or inpatient environment whether it's in the inter in uh, whether it's in the uh, emergency room substance abuse can mask uh, their reports they cannot talk because they don't want to talk about it substance abuse can uh, exacerbate self-injurious behavior because especially if you have self-hatred, self-blame, uh, often intoxication will have an elevation period and then a depressive period. So it literally is a thing out there of people who are coming down from methamphetamine that that's when they cut. 
because they're feeling all kinds of negative self-blame things. But I've also seen people do bad things themselves in the excitement and agitation and confusion of being highly activated and through drugs. So basically drugs can make this harder. So you want to kind of uh, pay attention to that. Mind you, we do have another manual you can download for the website just on working with ITCT, use it, treating multi-traumatized, uh, socially marginalized kids who have problems and also are drinking or using drugs because it is slightly different than the other DRVs. You're supposed to have a break there, but it didn't happen then. Cool, two comorbidities. We get to skip that one completely. So when we're talking about now, what we're going to talk about from this point on is how do we actually uh, help people who are stuck in this jam. But before we do that, do, do you feel that you sort of understand the reactive avoidance model? So if you saw, if you, your next client was a 14 year old girl who cuts on herself with razor blades, has been doing it for two years, who's very embarrassed, what would you do? Well, first of all, if she has other comorbidities, you might even pay to the, more attention to them. If she's suicidal, if she's major substance abusing, you might want to work on that first. But as soon as you could, I would probably want you to give her that measure that you saw before that you have to see if it's a problem. Some people say zero and everything, fine. They may be lying, they may not, that's fine. But we gave them that opportunity to get to see if it's a big problem or not. You know, sometimes we can also uh, fetishize. Sometimes it's that one time every year they cut on themselves. And that may not need any intervention to the next time they try to cut when they're with you. You may not wanna do that. And that measure would tell you that. But I would want you to do that. And then if you did see that there were endorsements, then I would just want you to do an interview with them. We have in ITCTA a trauma review. So we would want you to do the trauma review. It's called Initial Trauma Review Revised. You can get that for free to just see what are your traumas. And it includes being not loved and other kinds of things. So we can figure that out. I'd want you to ask about attachment. What was it like when you were young? I'd like you to, if, you have, if you're trained to do it, I'd like you to make an inferential judgment about whether they seem to have good attachment now. Are they securely attached? Do they have a lot of abandonment issues? Are they dismissive so they don't have to deal with loss? You know, whatever it might be for them. And then do they have emotional regulation capacities, which ITCTA gives you some information on and, and we have it in, in other areas about trying to evaluate the balance between the emotional regulation you have and the amount of regulation you need, to, the amount of emotion you have that needs to be regulated. So I'd want you to do all those things. And then I would want you to say, Okay, so what we have here is not a baby borderline, not, a, not a, anyone but someone who had the bad luck of being born into a world where they were maltreated, it dysregulated attachment, interfered with emotional regulation, and now they're in the land of double whammy. The double whammy of they have more pain than other people that they carry around that can be easily triggered by reminiscence things in the environment. And when they do get triggered, they have less ability to handle that pain than people who haven't been hurt. And if you have more pain, then you have capacity to handle pain, you will always do what is necessary to get through it. The only reason you're not doing anything like that right now is because apparently you don't have to. The only reason you're not on, on your knees right now performing some sexual act on some creepy guy so that it'll give you enough money that you can get enough chemicals to shove it in your arm and make the world go away does not have anything to do with your psychodynamics. It has to do with luck. I mean, maybe I'm saying the extreme case, but it's just luck. Some of you have done stuff because there's a lot of trauma in the room. There has to be. Therapists have fairly high rates of trauma. You've done stuff. You know, that's just how it goes. And so what we need to do is find a way to be accepting of this, non-judgmental of it, but also have what psychologists call a functional analysis. What's the function of these behaviors? If we can figure out the functions, how can we intervene to do something about them? Any questions about any part of that process? Yeah. Instead of 
shake your head and act it on. So what she's saying is she was taught in suicide work that it's important to call suicide, suicide, kill yourself, those things if you want. I don't, I work with very acute populations. Often they're in the hospital or almost, or they're in the emergency or whatever. I sometimes do go lightly on that. Although I agree it's fine to, to not make it be something to be ashamed. I just talk about it legitimately, but some people are so freaked out that I'm a little careful with them. The question was, how about for the self injurious stuff? Do you ask them about it early? Do you ask them to go into it in detail, et cetera? Remember that if they're cutting on themselves on average, they have more pain than they have regulation for the pain. So if you have them do serious exposure or serious discussion, what are you probably doing? I'm not saying you don't do that, but what is the risk? You've activated distress in the absence of capacity to handle distress. The they may hurt themselves in the session. I had a gentleman when I was in Canada shove a, a paperclip through his palm. Uh, but you'll see, I've seen more contemporaneously and had clients say that they start punching their heads or they start doing other things. So the general idea here, and we won't talk about it in this little workshop, but we talked about a little bit in the one last week for the whole treatment, is people with low emotional regulation skills, we need to make sure we don't get them triggered into strong states because it will be overwhelming for them. So it's a hybrid, I would say, of what you're saying. I, I do want to talk about that stuff, but it doesn't have to be talked about right away. And it needs to be talked about in a way that's supportive and validating and doesn't use clinical terms. Because then it sounds like you're saying they're a head case. After all, they're seeing you and you're the fixer and they're the fixie. Therefore, there's power imbalance and they have less efficacy and they're less good than you are. You don't want to go into those places. So it's an interesting mixture of the both. I do think that if you can convey acceptance in your own way of relating to your clients, where you're not all freaked out about oh, what they did, I don't want you to go, oh my God, what did you do to yourself? But I might say, can you show me? I've even joked, I'm a connoisseur of, of cut arms. You know, you, you make a little joke or something. People actually like that because they've been so busy feeling ashamed of that stuff. Then you can often go more later, but I like your question. So. Just take as a given that if your client's involved in DRBs, it won't always be true, but if your clients are involved in DRBs, they probably can be easily triggered into states that they're not very good at regulating. And you want them to come back. So if you freak them out, they might not. Or they might lie to you because you asked them to say something they're not ready to talk about. Also, safety and therapy is one of the biggest things we have. They don't know if you're safe. You just ask them weird stuff. Here's an, a, a real obvious example is a lot of cultures don't want to talk about sexual things and even any culture, especially se victims of sexual stuff, social and culturally have been trained by those cultures to be ashamed of it and to blame themselves because that's the way that men can train women to be able to hurt them and have nothing bad happen to them for it. What it does, it produces in a patriarchy, it produces uh, the whole notion that women's sexuality is intrinsically bad on some level. So women have to be careful and don't be too much of anything. Don't flirt, don't ask for it. Don't, you know, men can do that. If a woman has a lot of sex, we call it promiscuous. If a man has a lot of sex and uses a condom and he's straight, we call it success. So we've got all these rules out there. So for instance, high rates of sexual behavior is right up there with self-injury and it's a separate workshop. Um, can you imagine, do you say to them, so how many sex partners do you have last week? Well, what went into what orifice? I mean, among other things, you may look like you're getting off on it and you may even be getting off on it. I mean, it's just too weird. So, and especially if you're working with someone from Southeast Asia or something in Sub-Saharan Africa, you just don't say that stuff right away. In fact, you actually say it slower than would be good practice if it wasn't that for those people talking about that stuff is so embarrassing, humiliating that they might not come back, they might not feel that you're safe. So in that case, we may use euphemisms. Uh, very common when I do interviews at USC for people to watch is I'll ask them about their child abuse histories and they won't want to tell me except that it happened. And I'll say, okay, so let's Let's go with the assumption, let's go with the fact that you told me there's bad stuff and I believe there's bad stuff. So let's just say there was bad stuff. How about if we have conversations now where we say, so there was bad stuff in your childhood. You don't have to tell me what it is. Maybe tell me why you can't tell me about what it is. But that marker, some people can really do that. They couldn't do the thing, but they can do bad stuff. And what happens, by the way, once they find out you're a nice person? 
They tell you what the bad stuff is, but they get to do it under their own speed. So thank you for that question. Very sure. So now what we're going to do is get a little bit into the treatment components of it. The first one, you've seen this over and over again, and it's predicated on the notion of the treatment outcome literature that basically says uh, that uh, the most effective things you can do as a therapist with clients is to have a positive therapeutic relationship with them. This is called the general factor finding. In therapy outcome literature, the biggest correlation with whether your client gets better in your presence is the quality of attunement, compassion, caring, support that you offer. The technique you use and the methodology you use is important, but not as important as the general factor. So in general, what we find is the general factor swamps the specific factor in predicting whether your work with any given person helps. So and there's a lot of reasons for that, but therapeutic acceptance, non-judgmental, positive regard, compassion, what that's going to do is facilitate attachment on some level. It's going to provide an environment where they can talk about painful things in safe environments, which is part of how we process. But it's also going to be good for pissed off, scared kids, because they don't have many people that have that role for them. And you may be of a different ethnicity, gender, orientation, et cetera. There may be a lot of reasons why they don't trust you. But ironically, if you can be repeatedly safe with them, they probably will because they're hungry for attachment and connection. So we want to do that stuff with kids. We want to facilitate some, not necessarily too much, but some attachment. Um, but the other part of this is that working on cutting, working on punching, working on sex, those things are all things that require the client to feel especially safe in sessions and especially understood and cared for. So if you try to do what the rest of today without having set up the quality of positive attunement, compassion, and a, a way of talking to them that lets them know that you don't think they've done anything wrong, you just think they're in a jam, if you can do that, they're going to stay with you. If you can't, they probably won't. And Cheryl and Randy and others can talk about, if you try to do ITCTA with a really messed up kid and you just work the program without trying to get that relationships going on, you're going to strike out. They're not going to come back. They're not going to believe you. And so it's the most nonspecific recommendation we have in ITCT, but it's a, but it's a pretty big one, the quality of the therapeutic relationship. Second of all, we want you to tune to acute safety issues. If someone's cutting on themselves, the two big things we want to worry about is cutting on yourself is correlated with suicidality. So I want you to do a full suicidality evaluation on any of your self-cutting kids. And I'm not going to tell you how to do that. That's another workshop. There are good books there on how to, that you can read on how to, to do with at least lethality assessment. But I would want you to know about means, method, opportunity, you know, those kinds of things, history around that so you can make some kind of an assessment. Some clinicians I found in supervision, uh, they don't want to ask their clients if they cut in any given week or burned or if they suicidal each week because they feel like they're pathologizing the client. But there is a way, at least I feel there's a way, to share with them that you take them seriously, including the jeopardy they're in. You're not saying, oh, you messed up person. You're saying, you know, your life is really complicated. Have you felt any suicidal feelings in the last week? Have you felt any... Uh, desire to cut on yourself. And then when they almost invariably say, yes, your job isn't to say, oh my God, I have to get you into a hospital. It's because that's very common. Many traumatized people have suicidal thoughts. It's to work with them. It's to assess what it means. For many people, suicidality is actually something they're leaning on as a coping strategy. What is that? What? But what's the coping strategy? Like how does being suicidal help you? Okay, so we said the way that it ends or a way out. So this is basically it, that a lot of people who are, feel they're very much up against it and a lot of bad things are happening. And they, what do they say to themselves? They say, I could always kill myself. And ironically, I'm up for that one. So I, I don't think there's wrong with talking that way to them saying, yeah, you know what? But the thing about suicide is it's so damn permanent. So if it can be a self-soothing device you use, I'm not going to tell you not to do that. I understand that for all of us, that's true. Um, but, you know, it wouldn't be something we would want to leap to. And the more that you have hope that you can do something, the more therapeutic relationship is conveying hope, the less suicide necessarily has to be an option. Uh, Life-threatening injuries. Uh, some people cut on themselves, hurt themselves. They give themselves concussions. They get septicemia. They get infections from cutting or from burning. 
Um, they can have uh, disfigurement, which can be a big deal. Some serious self-injury people, they try to hide it in tattoos and facial art. But remember, that's not this. Tattoos and body art are just tattoos and body art. Please don't think they're self-injury. We could get into that more, but it's been studied a lot. They're separate things. Doesn't mean that some people have a low threshold of doing things to their body through art because they have a low threshold because they also are self-injurious. But the, the, the goal of putting tattoos all over your body, sticking studs in all kinds of places, we have not found it's been helpful to see as a form of, of self-injury. However, um, the, the problem here is uh, that it all can mix together to some point. So some people want to use tattoos on their disfigurement. Tattoo can't cover their disfigurement. Figurement. There literally are tattoo artists out there who part of their job is they're really good at not only hiding old tattoos, but hiding old cutting. Because a lot of people who tattoo also cut on themselves, not because they're the same thing, but because they're, both, they're coming from positions of marginalization or anger or not feeling like they belong to the central stream. Not that that means that's why you tattoo, but some of those people are like that. So look for injuries, infections, disfigurement, uh, and just keep that in mind. This is something you'll see in the handbook, which I really would like you to download, the, the guide that we have for you, um, which is I, well, I, want, I don't want me to tell you that you could die from all these things so much in the sense of scaring people straight, telling them how disfigured they could be or how they could die from it, because that has not been shown to work. If you do a Google on scared straight methodologies, a couple of studies say it works, but only slightly. And a number of studies say that it, it motivates avoidance. So if you just, if you take uh, reckless drivers and make them go down to the, to the hospital and see dead people, it doesn't keep them from restless driving. If they get a, thrown in jail overnight for shoplifting, that doesn't actually, for most people, keep them shoplifting, especially if it's driven like this stuff is. So what you want to find out is uh, a way to, what I like to say is provide informed consent to your own DRB. I just want you to know what it is. And you can say that kindly. You can say, you know, Tom, if you keep cutting in yourself, I just need you to know you could get an infection. Is that ever happened? You know, you could bleed out. You could, you could cut a nerve. You could get disfigured. You know, Susan, uh, you keep talking about cutting yourself in the face. And I know that that's because of how upset you feel. Uh, do we need to talk all about what it would be like if you did have your face cut? Not like what, how bad you would look, but just have people talk about it. Because I do think it's not malpractice, but it's a problem if you don't do psychoeducation on the potential outcomes associated with behavior. But you really need to practice in the mirror, if not somewhere else. How do you say this in a non-shaming, non-blaming, non-scaring way so that they understand the downside? Take binging and purging. For binging, the biggest downside for binging is you might die. So I want you to know that binging will deplete your electrolytes. Depleted electrolytes will alter your heartbeat rhythmicity and you can develop a fatal arrhythmia and die. And that's happened a lot. You've probably heard about people, movie stars and others who, who uh, after treatment for bulimia, they died. They just croaked. Because if you binge too much, you deplete potassium and sodium and other electrolytes you need to maintain optimal electrical balance that, that determines your heartbeat rate. So if your chemicals are weird, all sorts of bad things can happen to you. So if I'm working with bulimics, and that by that workshop's a little more heavy duty than this one, uh, because the risks are higher, I for sure want them to know about what it can mean. But I want to practice being able to say it in a way that doesn't freak them out. We're gonna probably, one of the biggest things we're gonna do for anybody who's involved in any kind of, of distress reduction behaviors, and certainly relates to self-injurious behaviors, is we're gonna see if we can find ways to increase your emotional regulation capacity. Remember the problem here is you're carrying around a lot, a lot of pain, but because your attachment was messed with early on in life, you never really did learn how to regulate your emotions. In a longer workshop, I spent a little time talking about how attachment dysregulation interferes with emotional regulation. But take that, that that's a finding in the literature, it's established truth, and uh, that uh, what that means is that if we could increase your ability to regulate your emotional states, even though you were triggered, you could use those methodologies to keep from being overwhelmed, and then you wouldn't actually have to cut in yourself or do whatever else you're doing. So 
we talk about uh, distress reduction and affect regulation training. They can be seen as slightly different things. When we do divide it that way, distress reduction means if you're upset right now, what could you do? If you're freaked out right this second, what could you do in the next four minutes? Another one, affect regulation training or distress or emotional regulation training is more like, can you learn long-term skills that allow you to, whenever you get activated, to bring that down fairly automatically or on a regular sort of basis? And then sometimes we talk about a third one, which comes from dialectic behavior therapy, which is emotional tolerance. Can you learn how to feel bad without doing anything about it? Would you agree, based on what we've said today, if we could take our clients and teach them these skills, they probably wouldn't have to cut on themselves so much. So some of this is done during trauma processing, which we're not going to cover today hardly at all, um, because it's probably not the most effective way to work with self-injurious behaviors. Later on, for someone who's gotten some stability and control over this self-injury, trauma processing is a great idea. But if you ask them to process trauma too early, you're likely to overwhelm them by making them talk about painful events when they don't yet have enough emotional regulation skills. But there is this thing which you'll see in the book and you'll see in the guide that you can get that uh, as you learn how to um, regulate emotional states, you get better at trauma processing because talking about what your dad does doesn't blow you away. You can stay with it while you're still talking about it. So you do learn how to regulate emotions just by getting upset and unupset over and over again in therapy. So that is actually one of the sleeper effects of emotional regulation training. Wouldn't you agree if you think about the work you've done with clients that at the beginning they're going, when my father grabbed me, I was so scared of you. But then, and they can't say more than that. And then 40 sessions later, they're saying, yeah, you know, the worst time you did that was the time, you know, how did you get from A to B? You got there because they did some not, they may have processed some of their pain, but they actually develop more skills about being able to sit with distress. When you first talking about painful things that you haven't been talking to people about, you're pretty bad at it. You can get overwhelmed very easily. So therapy itself teaches emotional regulation skills, but we try to teach other things. And you can find this in the, in the guidebooks, in the ITCTA manual, the guidebooks, and in the separate book on self-injurious behavior. Um, the first one is relaxation training. Uh, basically, people who get triggered into negative states, if they could learn how to relax at that moment, they might be less likely to act on the triggered desire. This is a little tricky because you can get, when you induce relaxation, there is paradoxical anxiety. Have you heard of that? So if you relax when you're tense, most people just relax. Some people, when they relax, they feel like they've lost some of the protective vulner, uh, invulnerability and willingness to be able to fight or their muscle armor or whatever it is. And so when they relax, they actually get more freaked out. Now, if that happens to your client, it's not a mental health emergency. Just don't do, have them do relaxation for a while. They'll come back right away. But it can be that if people try to do relaxation and it's not good for them, that will actually increase the likelihood they'll engage in a DRB. But in general, it's a pretty okay way to do it. Now, how do we teach relaxation? We could just say relax, doesn't work. We could say, okay, try relaxation right now, doesn't work. We could say, okay, try deep relaxation, progressive relaxation. So we can teach you how to selectively tense and relax parts of your body in, in a very specific and orderly way. Yeah, that works really good. That relaxes people more than anything we know of short of drugs. The problem is it takes some training on your part to be able to do it and it takes some training on the client's part to be able to do it. And lastly, we don't need you to be that relaxed. I'm not even sure if it's that good to be that relaxed. What we want you to be is less relaxed. So, I mean, yeah, less relaxed than totally relaxed, but more relaxed than you were before. And so we usually do breath, train, breath training in this breath brace. <laughs> breath-based relaxation. How many of you were at the last session here last week? Okay, so you saw that Dr. Semple talked about this, I talked about this. Uh, learning how to breathe as a relaxed person is a, definitely a skill you can develop. We're not gonna go into it now, but it's in the manuals, it's in all of them actually. Um, but we use the counting method. So this is called mindfulness breath training. And basically what it means is that you count as you inhale, then you pause, then you count as you exhale, and you count to three. So one, two, three, inhale, one, two, three. No, one, two, three, as you inhale, hold, one, two, three, as you exhale. And what can happen is you slowly learn what your cadence is. And it's different for every one of you. You learn how slow to count so that when you need to relax, you count to yourself, one, two, three, and hold, three, two, 
one and hold, those methodologies over time, you know to start breathing when you say one, mid breath is two, full breath is three, hold, exhalation is three, middle exhalation is two, end of exhalation is one, hold. Now, uh, Randy and I developed the current version of this in our work with trying to reduce uh, trauma symptoms in acutely burn, burn survivors in a burn unit at USC. And it had some efficacy, but, but it was a small study. Clearly, if you can do it with burn people and people with smoke inhalation burns, it should be helpful for other people too. So the idea is when people are triggered and they get into major distress, if they can practice breathing, they can get into a much more relaxed thing. This has to do with something called the Benson's relaxation response developed in the 60s, 70s at Harvard. Basically, if you breathe like a relaxed person, you'll calm down. If you breathe like a nervous person, you'll get more anxious. But then what we do is we have you practice it when you're on a date practice it in various situations. But what we find is a lot of people, I think I mentioned this last week, they can learn a method like breathing, but they can't learn how to use it until they've actually practiced it when it's actually relevant. So what we do is when your client gets upset in the session, that's a perfect opportunity for them to practice breath training. So we usually have you practice it at the beginning of a few sessions. Maybe practice it when you get anxious during the sessions. And then we have you practice it at home. And I think it's not in these manuals, but it's gonna be in the mindfulness manual. Is that right, Randy? There'll be an actual uh, thing you can laminate that is just the one, two, three, three, two, one, and people can carry it around in their pocket. So that when you do get freaked out, you can practice this thing. But what we want the client to do is practice at least multiple times a week, ideally five times a week, of relaxing themselves for at least 10 minutes at the same time every evening using this so that they can get very well versed in it and then start to do it relatively automatically. That will already help. If you're getting triggered into a state and you practice that breathing, it's gonna bring down your autonomic reactivity because your autonomic nervous system, your sympathetic nervous system, fight or flight or freeze nervous system is gonna be going down. And as it goes down, there's less that self-injury would have to be used for because you're not as freaked out as you were before. We use emotional identification and discrimination, which is just working with the client to see if they can figure out what their emotions are during therapy. A lot of people who cut on themselves or do other things don't know what they're feeling. They were so shut down when they were young that, that if you ask them now what they're feeling, they just say they feel bad or scared or mad, but they never change what they say. They don't give you different emotional states or their favorite one is, I don't feel anything. But it turns out they do actually feel stuff. And there is a small body of research that shows if you know what you're feeling, you're much better at regulating that feeling than if you don't know. If you don't know whether you're mad or scared, what do you do next? It's going to be harder to teach you how to get into a better state. So we just do something called emotional detective work. You can read about this. Um, basically asking the client to see if they can figure out what they're feeling. Not figure out what they're feeling. Not figure out what they're feeling based on uh, on their intellect or just seeming to know, but what we call outside in figuring out. Outside in is watching your body, watching your mind and guessing what you're feeling is based on what your body is doing and what your thoughts are doing. So we call it emotional detective work because it'd be something like, Susie, what are you feeling? I don't know. Well, what's your body doing? Well, I'm all tensed up. What are your hands doing? They're clenched. What are you thinking? I want to kill that asshole. Then you might say, uh, do you have any other feelings? Yeah, I've, I'm having this... Uh, you know, whatever it might be. And then you say, okay, so based on all that stuff, do you have any guess what you might feel? And they might, she might say, well, I said I want to kill someone. That sounds angry. I'm feeling tense. Maybe it's anger. Now, what's interesting here is I don't want you to say yes or no to the answer. You can't be attached to the outcome. What you're really just doing is providing people with opportunities to problem solve and figure out what their emotional states are. The idea, if I ask you enough times, you'll get better and better at learning how to, to, uh, to figure this stuff out. We, we sometimes say it's like that quasi-biblical analogy, that if you have a hungry person, it's better to give them a fishing pole than a fish. The issue here is if someone's activated and you say you're angry, you've sort of them, just ripped them off. First of all, you might be wrong because who knows if they're actually angry. People have very complicated emotional states, especially if they're using avoidance. Maybe they're scared mostly. Like for a lot of men, we become angry because we feel inadequate. So what's the emotion? Is it anger or is it inadequacy? Is inadequacy a cognition or an affect? It gets very, very complicated, but 
So what you don't want to do is tell them what it is. You just want to give them opportunities to make a guess. And then usually what we want you to say afterwards is, well, that sounds like that's a pretty good guess. And the client might even say to you, do you think I am angry? Don't go there. I know you want to go there. I know you want to sound smart. Do not tell clients what they feel. The odds you're wrong are very high, plus the fact you just deprived them of figuring it out what it is. You just gave them the fish. They need the fishing pole. So I recommend three or four times a session you ask clients what they're feeling. But you don't make it be like they're, getting, they're not getting a pop quiz. It's not like they give the right answer. It's just that stuff at whatever level they Emotional discrimination is part of that too, but sometimes it's important for the client to figure out whether they're mad at others or mad at themselves, or they're uh, scared or they're having a panic attack, which sounds like the same thing, but one's a resting state of anxiety and one is actually an acute uh, respiratory involved uh, state. Uh, we will also teach people to see if they can resist self-injury. This will also be in the next slide, which is a big slide for us. Um, but the question is, uh, can you resist cutting on yourself? Now, this is weird. Okay, so, and this comes from something called uh, a mindfulness-based relapse prevention, which is a mindfulness technique worked for treating people who relapse into substance abuse. But it's being used a lot now for self-injury, so I'd like to invite you to think about that. Basically, what this involves is, um, if, if you came to me when you were cutting on my, yourself, You've probably heard this. Some clinicians believe you're supposed to write, have them write a contract that they sign that they won't cut on themselves. Well, let's get real. If they could do that, why would they come to see you? So what's happening is all a contract is doing is driving therapy underground because they're still going to do it. Now they need to either tell you that they didn't do it and feel like they're let, you've let them, they've let you down and they're a bad client, or they many times they'll learn to lie. So they'll say, no, I didn't cut on myself. Basically, what I would like you to do is ask the client to see if they can keep from cutting on themselves as long as possible. And then if they have to cut on themselves, that they do as little to themselves as they can. You will always win at that as long as you make the effort, right? If you tried and you could only not do it for seven sessions, seven seconds, you come back, the therapist gets to say, congratulations, that's good, seven seconds. Because you tried, you didn't do it in one ses second. Then maybe the next time you don't do it for 11 minutes and then you do it. But then the next time you only do it for four seconds again. None of it, it's not a progressive thing exactly. It's that every time there's going to be a different amount of triggering. You're going to have a different level of emotional regulation. You'll have different level of struggles in your life. So you're going to do it more or less at different times. But the idea here is what will happen if you stretch it out longer and longer over longer periods of time. The original relapse prevention idea of this was eventually what will happen. The developers of that said that there's a half-life of triggered states, that when we get triggered into a state, if we can not do anything about it, it will fade relatively quickly. So if you want to cut on yourself because you just felt horrible shame because your partner said something about you that was sexually embarrassing, and you want to cut on yourself, if you can sit in that pain for five or six minutes, not try to block it, push it away, or hang on to it, just let it be there, it's going to fade on its own. So the idea here is if you resist engaging in the behavior, it may just go away and you won't have to cut on your behavior. <coughs> this could take a long time. And it may be for some clients, it's not that they won't stop, it's just they'll do it less severely. And it doesn't mean that if they stop this time, they won't do it again next time. You have to be taking the big picture like, Susan, Fred, that's so great that you are able to stop that time. As you know, we talked about this, maybe that may not be true next time because it's always different. But this is definitely good news about how you seem to be getting this stuff nailed. You know, you seem to be knowing what's going on. So do as, go as long as do as little as possible. By the way, in self-injury, I wouldn't recommend you say, like, instead of cutting yourself with razor blade, just stab yourself. Or, you know, don't get into that stuff because you're basically telling them stuff that could be used against you in a court later that you told your client how to hurt themselves. It's just something like, if you're going to cut on yourself, how could you cut on yourself the least? I say this because there are websites out there that say when you want to cut on yourself, um, you know, stick uh, lemon juice in your mouth. Those are called replacement behaviors. We'll try to talk about them very briefly. Generally, that's not good stuff to tell people instead of the one way it hurts you, use another way that hurts you. But certainly to say, don't do it for as long as possible and then do it as little as possible. It's going to be pretty cool. A version of this is going to be called... Um, is, uh, should I talk about it now or should I talk about it later? Uh, 
Well, it's called urge surfing, if you've heard of that. Has anyone heard of urge surfing? So the idea is the urge to cut, you just, this comes from an old saying by John Kabat-Zinn, the father of mindfulness in North America. He said, uh, you can't stop a wave, but you can learn to surf. So you can't stop the urge to cut on yourself, but you can learn to ride the, the desire without doing anything about it. And that's the same kind of an idea. You're sitting with the feeling. It could be the urge to binge, the urge to have sex, the urge to cut on yourself, the urge to use a drug or whatever. And as you do that, what happens over time is both your number of times you do things decreases, the severity of what you do tends to decrease as well. It also tends to generalize, right? Because remember all these different DRBs besides cutting all arise from the same underlying process. So you, you, it may be that if you practice that enough, not only do you cut on yourself less, maybe you binge purge less. And, you know, we have theories for all that. Some of what I told you, but Linehan's theory is really much straightforward in this phrase. She just thinks you can learn how to tolerate pain without doing anything about it. So she says, you're just working out your emotional regulation muscle, just sitting with pain without stopping pain over and over again. It's going to get you better at pain. And have you seen this? That some people will have like cancer that's in really bad shape and they go to work anyway. Somebody else would be just like me has a little bit of cancer and they completely have to stay home. You know, the, the, both of them are right, but the point is that one of them apparently can tolerate more cancer-related difficulties. They have cancer, but that's not the final descriptor of whether it's going to debilitate their behavior until maybe later in the process or maybe never. So in this room, probably some of us, uh, you know, if something happens, we give up a little bit. Some of us in this room, if something happens, we just problem solve it. We just hang in there and it's that kind of approach that can teach you more control over your activation. Now, a lot of what we talk about here is something called trigger management. And it's actually what we've talked about so far, but I just wanna talk about it formally here. And it, it's a whole chapter in, that, in the, the guide that you can download. The tr trigger, trigger management means an awful lot of self-injurious behavior happens after you've been triggered. You've encountered something in the current environment that reminds you of early attachment or trauma related phenomenon, which then triggers the original emotional states you have, which is overwhelming to you, but you don't have enough internal ways of handling that distress. Now, part of what we just talked about is you could learn ways of handling that distress, but what we now do almost universally, both in ITCTA in general and with self-injurious behaviors and the other DRBs, is we teach people if they can figure out about their triggers. And this is a big, big deal. In the ITCTA, we refer to the trigger grid. And uh, feel free, to, I don't think you have it here now, but uh, you can access it. Basically, what we want you to do is recognize that when you want to cut on yourself, we want your client to recognize that when they want to cut on themselves, it didn't come from nowhere. A lot of times people will say that. Say, why did you want to cut on yourself? I don't know, I just suddenly wanted to. All, I would want you to think almost always. I, would, I think always, but you never know. Almost always the desire to cut in yourself comes from not steady state distress, but a trigger in the recent interpersonal environment that activated early emotional pain that is now overwhelming and needs to be dealt with since you don't have enough internal ways of handling it right now. So what we want the client to do is recognize that they've been triggered, know what their triggers are, know what it feels like when they've been triggered, once they've been triggered, figure out what the triggers relates to in their past, and then intervene with the things that we talked about already to try to keep themselves from going with that trigger. But a big part of this is, has to do with what in mindfulness is called metacognitive awareness. Metacognitive awareness, which mostly came from mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, says, if I can know that some of my thoughts are just thoughts, they won't bother me as much. If I can know that my feelings are just feelings, they won't bother me as much. If I say to myself right now, oh my God, John, there's still more for you to do and you're not done. You're such a loser, stupid asshole. That would be not very mindful if I just heard that and started feeling bad about myself. But what if I said to myself, oh my God, I'm telling myself I'm a stupid asshole. Do you hear the difference? So that's saying it's something that I do as a result of my trauma history and what I'm presenting and all that stuff, but that it makes sense that I'm saying it, but just because I'm saying it doesn't mean it's true. Let's say right now I suddenly get, have a panic attack. Metacognitively, I might say, oh my God, I'm having a panic attack. I wonder what that's from. If I wasn't metacognitive, what would I say? There's danger in the room. 
So what, 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 what trigger identification does is when you can say I'm just triggered now, guess what? There's nothing to be upset about anymore. I'm overstating it, but do you get it? If you're being triggered into abandonment issues when you were five, that's not here now. The trigger is just the trigger. So you can start to say, you know, my partner is making me furious right now because I feel like she's abandoning me, but I know it's coming from my history. That may not stop you from acting out a little bit, but it generally will help in that regard. So we get you very comfortable with, with uh, what your triggers are and then figuring out ways that you can handle them. Generally, if you do, do get triggered, what could you say to yourself metacognitively? Like, these are just my thoughts. This is just my memories. What could you, you know, I, uh, how could you learn to urge surf when you get triggered? How could you learn to, to use deep breath? How could you learn to distract yourself by talking to other people? There's a whole number of different things we can figure out to do in that circumstance. We're out of time now. What? I don't know what you're saying. Yeah, I'll get to the question. So that is the trigger grid. We're not going to actually talk about titrated exposure here uh, or mindfulness exactly, except to say that exposure therapy will work with this stuff. But the problem is when clients are deeply into distress reduction behaviors, they're not ready for uh, titrated exposure. So if you are going to do this work, you can look at it in the ITCTA manual as well as the self-injury manual. Just remember, you're asking people to process pain potentially before they have enough ability to handle pain. So for all of the DRBs, we don't usually start with emotional processing. And when we do it, we do it in small pieces that we call uh, titration. And lastly, we can just teach mindfulness training, which, uh, man, uh, which we, we do various times in different ways in the different manuals. We have an upcoming mindfulness manual. I don't want to just add too much here, but it turns out if you can literally teach your clients mindfulness, what will happen is when they get triggered, they'll be mindful of the fact that they've been triggered. And they'll have metacognitive awareness of what the trigger actually represents. They will have also learned in mindfulness how to calm themselves down, down, quote unquote, so that when they do get in an active state, it has less power. So I'm not talking about mindfulness workshop because I don't want to get into the skills of that, but I do want you to know that if we do do a mindfulness one, which we probably will soon, or when the mindfulness is done, and Randy and I are just finishing it right now, uh, that mindfulness is very powerful for all the DRBs. It's just another method of de-escalation, of metacognitive awareness, et cetera. All right, we have, if you could just hang in a couple seconds, we have a couple of questions. How do we use your model with clients with OCD exhibiting self-harm and self-injurious behaviors? I have a client who, at who is at times cuts when she reports she does tolerated distress and to distract her from her feelings and thoughts about fear of failure and self-blame. She also has a lot of compulsions that are not harmful, rituals, etc. Let me tell you that the uh, we now know that it's, this is closer together than we thought. We used to thought, think that triggered trauma states and OCD were completely different things, but most people now think OCD is two different things. One of them is a more serotonergically, biologically based, genetically inherited one. And the other one is probably some version of these DRBs that you're distracting yourself, soothing yourself, et cetera. For clients that have the actual biological uh, OCD, I would probably want to work on that first with psych meds, if that's what it is. And we have CBT methods that are more effective than psych meds if you have the luck to refer people out to that kind of work. Um, but just be aware of a lot of what look like OCDs are actually just high level uh, DRBs. They're, they're, the, the obsession is that they're worried about the thing and the compulsion is that they have to cut on themselves or whatever it might be. So it's a very good question. We would not use this stuff today to work with classic OCD, but could it ever be helpful? Yeah, clients who have obsessions and now they're driven to undo the problem or fix the problem, they might be able to use the stuff we've been talking about to keep from having to act on the, on the obsessive part, which produces the compulsive part. But I think the big take home message here would be they are separate things except when they're not. And when they're not, it's usually when this stuff looks a little more OCD than it actually is. And that's where assessment can be really helpful. And then is DRB or SIB always physical? What about adolescents who purposely self-sabotage, create situations where they're harmed, expelled, punished, yelled at, spanked? Could this be in the same family, especially if they are doing these things to get the same results, cry for help, attention, reduction, those kinds of things? Uh, no. Uh, well, it, they could be the same goals, and it might be some of the interventions be the same, but we're not talking about that. So DRBs or self-injurious behaviors are actual 
behaviors that you use that produce distress. The stuff about uh, getting yourself in trouble, uh, uh, selling yourself short, uh, doing those sorts of things, self-defeating behaviors, et cetera, are very, very complex. Could be do a whole bunch of things. It may relate to this, but it may not. But if you have a client who just seems to always undercut herself, never succeeds, I probably wouldn't be talking about this stuff unless I saw there were trauma connections and I could link it to the actual behaviors. So the answer is sort of, uh, yeah, it is always physical, but that doesn't mean that the writer isn't correct, that sometimes people do other things for part that partially accomplish the same kind of goals, but I probably wouldn't get as doctrinaire and specific with that as we are with this stuff. Yes, Randy. On my phone? They're in where? You texted them to me? God damn. Oh my God, it's true. There's no hiding. I can't read them. What a relief. Uh, it didn't work, Randy. So do you have them? They're not big enough. See, they came like that and, and the writing's too small. Why don't you just read them? The first question is, I recently attended a DBT training where the presenter said there is research that says that putting something red, like ketchup on areas where they used to cut, actually provided some, quote, relief, unquote, in the way of actual cutting did for people who cut. Have you heard of this? Yes. Yeah, so there's a lot in the manual that I couldn't cover now, but this notion of can you substitute a self-injurious behavior with something else? It's dangerous when your substitute is also bad for you. And, and there are a lot of recommendations like that. So be very careful. The lowest level of the replacement is to write on your hand with red where you want to cut. Um, so it's been tried a million times and almost every clinician does it will tell you that it doesn't seem to make any difference. Now they got a red line on their hand. Uh, but it could be for the small number of people that need to feel some externalization and some kind of marker, maybe that would work. Uh, I, I don't mind if you do that, but I would, I would be surprised if it worked. It's, it's, it's probably the thing that's most brought up with uh, yeah, but yeah, but it doesn't work. The next question is when using emotion identification, I have a list of emotions in my therapy room that aids in increasing emotional vocabulary. Do you have any opinions on this? I think it's a great idea. The problem is the client still has to figure out what their emotion is. So what we're, it's like elixothymia. They have an emotion, they just don't know what it is. How do they figure out what that emotion is? So you might have like a chart with different smiley faces and frowny faces and the name of the emotion used for kids, but it doesn't work that well because you don't know, you have an inchoate, freaked out internal state and you don't know which one to link it to. This is why some clinicians will spend time going, well, do you feel scared? I don't know. Well, what, do, what are your thoughts? That's the emotional detective work. So if you can pull that off, and it comes up a lot, and I think some people can, if you can find external ways that clients can learn to have a greater emotional vocabulary, good on you. But generally for this kind of problem, they don't, all they know is that they're overwhelmed in a chaotic internal state, and they don't have a lot of really easy ways to hook it to anything other than emotional detective work, I think. And the last question is, can smoking be considered a DRB? Okay, smoking would not be a DRB. It would be substance abuse. So, I, you know, I, there are reasons for what I'm about to say, but I'm not going to go into it. We divide avoidance behaviors into three categories, substance abuse, dissociation, and distress reduction behaviors. And they all operate differently. They all respond to treatment slightly differently, but they're all highly correlated. So substance abuse would be drugs, alcohol, and nicotine, which is a drug. Uh, dissociation is just dissociation. And then self-injurious behaviors are the kinds of things we've talked about so far. Now, interestingly, could substance abuse respond to the stuff we talked about today? Sure, if you're triggered into fixing with heroin, or you could smoke or not smoke, but you could delay that smoke and maybe just take a puff or just, you know, it is what we're talking about. So it could be the same, but to make a technical answer, the answer is uh, we would not include it in that, although the interventions might be close to it. Uh, I think we're done. Are there any questions that anyone has? Yes.
So she's saying that in some contexts, uh, especially where it's uh, foster care, where there's a multiple placements, maybe the placements are short term, there's not really a chance for the kid to develop a strong relationship with the clinician. And since we predicated this whole thing with that being important, she's asking, can you still do some help even if it's short term ad hoc? Uh, yeah, I think you can. You can teach skills a little bit but it's just not gonna be as good. So therapy is the art of the possible. I must say this twice a week in my work. And so the, if you can teach them um, to work the trigger grid, which is part of the manual, if you can have them use that form and identify things, if you can have them develop breathing techniques and stuff. Actually, some people say that skills-based interventions can, are one of the things you can accomplish without a strong therapeutic relationship. It's just that it's probably not gonna be as good, but. And I wouldn't do it if you have two sessions, but if they've got six sessions, maybe they could learn some of that stuff. The problem will they be able to let you in enough. Remember, I didn't say this before so much, but I know you know this, you're asking people to give up the only thing that works. You just fell off a cliff and grabbed a branch halfway down and you're screaming, oh my God, oh my God, someone save me. I'm, I just fell off a cliff. I'm grabbing out of this one branch and below me 50 feet below are a bunch of broken beer bottle strewn lava rocks and I'm dying, I'm dying, help me someone. And suddenly a voice comes out of nowhere and says, hello, I can help you. You say, oh my God, there is a God, there's a God. Well, no, actually, I'm a licensed psychotherapist. I don't care, just help me on the branches, I'm falling. It's really several simple steps. Oh, good, good. What's the third step? Because I feel the branch starting to pull out of the thing. I, what do I do? Oh, the first step is the easiest step. What's that? Just let go of that branch. That's this, right? So, of course, you're not going to want to stop drinking when drinking is keeping your pain away. You're not going to stop cutting on yourself. There's going to be a lot of reasons that people won't want to. So, even though they don't want to, do the DRB, all the people you're treating have chosen DRB over the other thing because the other thing's even worse. So we have to have great humility and appreciation that people are trying to do whatever they're doing. Some people are up to it with relatively little social interpersonal support. For a lot of people, they, they might need to work with, and I don't write this down, they might need to work with you for three to six months before they can even really get into this stuff because they're having to tell you shameful things, they're having to sit with distressing things. They need to know that you can soothe them by being present, but they can't get that until they've been with you long enough. They need to know you understand them and you're not stigmatizing them because guilt and shame is a huge part of it. So can, can it be done? Yeah, to some extent. Uh, would it be better with a longer term relationship? Definitely. All right. Thank you very much. Take care, you guys.